On March 4th, 1933, against the backdrop of the Great Depression, Franklin Roosevelt was inaugurated as the 32nd President of the United States. America was in the third year of the Great Depression. The average income of Americans had dropped by a staggering 40%. Unemployment rates had surged to 25%. And Americans were afraid. Afraid of total financial ruin, afraid of extreme poverty, afraid of starvation. And against this backdrop, FDR gave one of the most famous lines from all presidential speeches in United States history when he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Today, 90 years later, our lives are better in every measurable way. For example, our median incomes are seven times higher than what they were when FDR was inaugurated. That's after they've been adjusted for inflation. Our lifespans are 12 years longer. If someone from that era could get a glimpse of our lives today with all of our advancements, with all of our technologies, with all of our medical innovations, with all of our devices and entertainment and travel options, they would be excused if they assumed that in America, fear would become a thing of the past. That people living today wouldn't have any reason anymore to harbor fear. But yet, fear runs rampant in America today. Why is that? Why do we see fear in the people around us, and why do we experience fear at the level we do, considering our lives are measurably better than everyone who's come before us? Well, part of human nature is to experience fear, yet in our generation, there are two unique tailwinds that are propelling fear, and these are two new tailwinds that have not existed in any generation before us. Uh, the first has to do with capitalism and free market in the digital age. Let me explain. Fear is the emotion that commands attention. That's the purpose of fear. If you're a Christian and you believe that God made us, then he made us as emotional creatures with the ability to feel fear. And fear has an important purpose in our lives for flourishing. Namely, fear is the emotion that commands your attention. Fear is the emotion that when there's a threat to your well-being, to your health, to your prosperity, to your survival, or to a loved one's well-being, fear is the emotion that rallies your full mental focus and your physical energy toward resolving this threat, towards dealing with this problem, okay? If, if you feel fear, you are not able to fill out a crossword puzzle or daydream about the future or work on your shopping list because fear is the emotion that rallies your full support around the threat and says, we need to deal with this. This is priority number one. That's the purpose of fear. It keeps us safe and healthy. That's why fear commands our attention. But this reality of humanity is being exploited by people who want to make money. The news media, for example, serves up a menu of constant fear, new things to fear, whether they're political fears, such as immigration, gun restrictions, a lack of gun restrictions, a presidential election rematch that two-thirds of Americans did not want to see, abortion, or whether it's existential fears such as war, nuclear weapons, global warming, or economic fears such as inflation, or possible recession, soft landing versus hard landing. Media serves up a menu of fear because they know that fear commands your attention. Now, to be clear, this is not 
a right wing or left wing thing. This is Fox News and it's MSNBC. Okay, and, and the fringe channels beyond that, this is social media influencers because fear is the emotion. Its purpose is to command our attention. So people will serve up a menu of fear in order to command your attention because attention drives views. Whatever you fear will command your attention. That's where your eyeballs will go or that's where your clicks will go. And in the digital age, views bring money. Media gets its revenue based on ads. How else are they going to survive? So if they can collect more views, they get more money. Social media influencers get paid based on how many clicks they can get. So they will throw out fear. People will exploit you by trying to tap into your fear, by fear mongering to get more attention more views, more clicks, because that's how they get paid. Now, poli politicians often leverage fear for this very purpose. Okay? Here's what it sounds like. If my opponent is elected, it will be the end of America. If the other side wins, they will steal your freedoms. Listen, let's be wise. Any, pol any politician, this is right and left, that uses tactics like that is fear-mongering to garner votes and financial support. Here's what a responsible politician looks like. That's not all politicians. Here's what a responsible politician sounds like. Hey, there's this real problem we're facing, whether it's locally or nationally. Here's this real problem. Here's how I think we can best address this problem, and here's how I'm going to execute it. That's why I want your support. That's what someone who wants to responsibly govern sounds like. But often, politicians will simply fear-monger because it works, even though the cost of that is the stability of America itself. You see, fear is rooted in uncertainty. If someone can stoke fear, it will increase your uncertainty. Uncertainty erodes trust, and without trust, society breaks down. Without trust, problems cannot be solved, either on a local or a national level. Look at a family. If there's not trust in a family, problems can't be solved. So it's taking a huge toll on society, but the bottom line is, because fear commands attention, because attention drives views, because views bring money, fear has been successfully monetized. There is financial incentive for people to cause fear. So that's the first tailwind driving fear in our society today. Second tailwind, the rise of the digital age has coincided with the decline of religious practice in America, specifically Christianity. Today, 25% of Americans, when it comes to religious affiliation, describe themselves as being atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. 25% of us. Christopher Bader is a researcher and an author, and his field of study is fear. For about 20 years, he's been publishing an annual list of Americans' top 10 fears. A few months ago, he was interviewed by the New York Times, and he cited the fall of religious practice in America as one of the tailwinds of fear. Here's what he said. When you lose religious practice on a societal level, it can have a big effect, causing us to be afraid. You see, he explained, fear is rooted in uncertainty. Religious practice is something that gives people certainty, that there is a God in heaven who's with them, that he has a plan for our future, and it brings neighbors together in community. And when you have people coming together in community to build relationships with one another, trust increases. And as trust increases, it pushes back against fear. But with the decline of religious practice, it creates a tailwind for fear in America. So what are we to do individually and as a community with the fears that we feel? Well, the idea of this series, First and Second Americans, is that what if we got a letter in the American church today? Because if you open the Bible, if you open the New Testament, 
One of the things you'll notice is after we get through the biographies of Jesus, most of the rest of the New Testament is a collection of letters, letters written by first century apostles, people like Paul or Peter or James or John. If you've been here a while, you've, you've heard me say Paul wrote this, John wrote this, and they're letters written to people, churches, Christians living in specific cities scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And, and they're explaining to them, hey, in your specific cultural context, what does it look like for you to follow Jesus, for you to organize your life around Jesus right where you live in this city? And these letters were often named after the recipients. So we have books of the Bible called Ephesians, named after the people of Ephesus, or First and Second Thessalonians, named after the people of Thessalonica, or First and Second Corinthians, which is written to the church in Corinth. Well, this series is First and Second Americans. What if God, through an apostle in the first century, wrote us a letter today. What would it tell us about organizing our lives around Jesus in our cultural moment, in our context today? And I think if one of those first century apostles could look into the future and see where we live in America today, I believe that the letter would start out with addressing our fears. Now, fear, as I said before, is not a bad thing by itself. It serves an important purpose. But fear becomes a problem when it's not properly calibrated. In other words, it, it triggers when there are things that you should not actually be afraid of, but it still creates fear inside of you. Uh, let me give you an example of fear that is not properly calibrated. I'll, I'll put it on the screen here. Tarantulas are docile creatures. If you pick one up, I have your attention now, don't I? If you pick one up in your hand, that's what fear does. I want views. If you pick one up in your hands, it's happy to chill. Bites are incredibly, unbelievably rare. If you are bitten by a tarantula, it's harmless to humans, and they're less painful than a bee sting. Now, you're not even looking at a real tarantula. You're looking at a two-dimensional image of light projected onto a screen in a state in which tarantulas do not natively live. A very large screen. <laughs> and many of you are thinking, I don't care, just get it off the screen. How many of you felt a little fear right there? Just a little uneasy, it's okay, it's okay, yeah. That's fear that has not been properly calibrated. There, you know there's nothing to fear, but still something inside of us feels fear around that. Well, today what I want to show you is the primary reason why God gave us fear. This was part of God's design for humanity. There is an important purpose that it serves. And once you learn the actual reason why God gave us fear, the primary reason, and you learn to retrain your mind around that reason, I'm telling you, you're not going to be afraid of anything again. And that is not hyperbole. I'm going to demonstrate that to you today. The biblical authors write about fear hundreds of times. If you read the Bible from beginning to end, it is impossible to escape the theme of fear. It comes up over and over and over again. Now, I think the most succinct verse in the Bible that describes the purpose of fear for which God created it is found in the Old Testament in the book of Psalms, where we see that Psalm 147 says this, the Lord delights in those who fear Him who put their hope in His unfailing love. Now, as we read that, for most of us, that does not make any sense. That there are too many ideas that are juxtaposed against one another that don't seem to fit together. What does this mean that the Lord delights in those who fear Him? Because to us, it sounds like God is sadistic or abusive as He wants us to be afraid of Him or God won't be happy until you're afraid of Him. And then if... if, if we're afraid of Him, how are we going to put our hope in Him? And if, and if He has this unfailing love that the author talks about, then why would we have fear of Him in the first place? And, and as Americans, this verse doesn't make sense to us. But here's what's fascinating. The author who wrote this 
assumed it made perfect sense to his audience. The author didn't see any contradictions here, and he didn't explain it because his original audience didn't either. His original audience didn't see any contradictions here. This made perfect sense to them, but it doesn't make perfect sense to us, which exposes a certain weakness in theology that Americans have, including American Christians. But if we understand, if we unlock the meaning of this verse, here's what we're going to get to today. If you learn what it means to fear the Lord, you'll never be afraid again. If you learn what it means to fear the Lord, you will never be afraid again. And I believe the first century apostle that was most equipped to write to us on this topic would have been the apostle John. John was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. And I think it's pretty easy to make the case that uh, for three years, he was Jesus' best friend. Uh, he's referred to in the biographies as the disciple that Jesus loved. He was part of the inner circle. There were three disciples. There was Peter, there was John, and there was John's brother James who like got to do special outings with Jesus and see special things for him. They were his inner circle. But John was the one that Jesus loved. In fact, when Jesus was being crucified and he saw J John was the only disciple who was brave enough to not go into hiding. And he was standing there with, with Jesus' own mother, Mary, and Jesus from the cross said, John, I want you to look after my mom for me. That's how close John was to Jesus. Well, after the crucifixion, after Easter Sunday, after Jesus ascended into heaven, John spent the rest of his life telling people, like the other apostles, you should follow Jesus. You should organize your life around Jesus because he rose from death on Easter Sunday. Now, what's interesting... John's story is that history tells us that he was the only one of the 12 apostles who was not murdered for following Jesus. And it wasn't for lack of effort. History tells us that he survived one execution attempt and then was exiled and banished to the island of Patmos in the Mediterranean Sea. It was a big rock in the sea. It was basically like the ancient world's version of Alcatraz. He's all alone. He lived, we believe, into his 90s. He's been alone for a very long time. He's locked up. And from this place, he writes the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And it has a lot to say about fear. What I love about Revelation is that right out of the gate, John gives us the purpose and the meaning of the entire book. People kind of get carried away with it. Uh, John says, let's, let's simplify this. Here's the purpose of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. Now, the hymn John is referring to is Jesus. He says, Here, you want to understand Revelation? Here's the point. Look, Jesus is coming, and John says he's coming with the what? He's coming with the uh, clouds. Now, he's not coming on a cloud. He's not coming through the clouds. He's not coming riding a cloud. He's bringing the clouds with him. Now, this is lost on us. But in the Bible, this particular type of cloud had a strong association when Moses led the people of Israel across the wilderness from Egypt in slavery into freedom in the promised land, they were led by a pillar of cloud. It's where God's glory was revealed to the people. When Solomon, the son of King David, dedicated the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, the cloud of God's glory came down and filled the temple, and the priests were so overwhelmed by the glory of God, they had to evacuate the temple. When Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on a mountain all alone, he wanted to reveal his glory to them, and he was transfigured before him, so they saw his glory, and when they did, they were enveloped by a cloud. In the book of Daniel, when Daniel had a vision of Jesus coming, he was coming with the clouds, because the clouds in the Bible symbolize the glory of God, the power of God, the holiness of God. And John says, here's the point of everything I'm about to write. Jesus is coming, and he is coming not as humble rabbi, but in his full glory. That's why people on earth will tremble and mourn because of him. He continues, so shall it be, amen. And then Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. This word has been so hijacked in this generation. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. It means 
I'm the beginning. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. It means I'm the end. At the beginning, Jesus says, it is me. At the end, Jesus says, it is me. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I am the one who is there at the beginning. I am the one who is here now. I am the one who will be standing at the end of all of it. I am the Lord Almighty. That's the theme of Revelation. If you ever want to read the book, hey, everything in the book is about that point. Now, John, I'm going to show us, here's how he gets the action started in Revelation. This is John just saying what happened. On the Lord's Day, which was Sunday, because although John grew up a good Jewish boy going to synagogue on Saturday, Easter changed everything. Say, all right, Sunday is now the Lord's Day because that's the day Jesus rose from death. On the Lord's Day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, meaning whoever's talking is clearly in charge. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. So John turns around, and what does he see when he sees who's standing there, whose voice sounds like a trumpet? Here's who he sees. The hair on his head was white like wool. I want you to picture this, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. John is grasping at the leash of language, trying to describe what he saw when he turns around and he sees Jesus standing there. It it is like seeing the full face of the sun. It is like feeling the full blast of a furnace. It is like hearing the rushing of every river in the world at once. Now, this isn't the only time John sees a glimpse of Jesus in his glory in Revelation. Here's the second time it happens in chapter 19. Again, I want you to envision this. John said, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. That's Jesus. He is faithful. He is true. He's on a white horse. This is going to be good. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has many crowns on his head because he doesn't just rule one kingdom. He rules all the kingdoms. He has all the crowns. He has all the authority. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. It means he's greater than us. He does not reveal everything to us. He is dressed in a robe Dipped in blood, pause, not the blood of his enemies. His robe is dipped in his own blood. Because when Jesus wages war, he does it, do it by destroying sinners. He does it, he did it by shedding his own blood on the cross to forgive sinners. That's the only chance we have before a God who is glorious, before a God who is judged. Jesus waged war against his enemies by shedding his own blood. So he is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. This is a callback to John chapter 1. John's writing Revelation. John also wrote one of the four biographies of Jesus. And John began his biography by saying, in the beginning, Alpha, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. But John now sees this is no longer seven pound, ten ounce baby Jesus in the manger. This is Jesus in all of His glory, but it's still the same Word that I told you guys about in that biography I wrote about His life. He continues, the armies of heaven were following Him riding on white horses, and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. You know why their linen is clean? Because they're not the ones who are actually waging the war. It's Jesus who did. They just get to follow Him and cheer Him on and see all the action and say, hey, this is great. Our clothes are clean. 
Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If you're looking for a tattoo idea, don't put this one on your thigh. That one's taken. Bad idea. But all of it says, listen, when, when, when we think of Jesus, we think of the humble rabbi who loves kids and is gentle and is loving toward his enemies and invites us to love one another, and that is 100% true, but it's incomplete. John gets a glimpse of Jesus in all of his glory, all of his majesty, all of his strength as the king who rules over heaven and earth. Tom Skinner was a black pastor who was born in Harlem in 1946. And in his youth, he was a gang member, part of the Harlem Kings, uh, but eventually converted and became a Christian and then went into ministry. And he earned a nickname, the Prophet of Harlem. And he would look at some of the artwork about about Jesus, where he's soft and has long hair and delicate features, and he would look at those pictures and say, that guy wouldn't last 10 minutes in my neighborhood. But what about this guy? The question is, would the neighborhood last in the presence of Jesus, whose eyes blaze like fire? who comes on the white horse, who has many crowns, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, John, who's telling us about all this, again, this is Jesus' best friend. This is the guy that Jesus personally handpicked. Will you take care of my mom after I'm gone? This is John. How does he react to seeing all of this? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now, now if that's John's reaction, what chance do you have? What, what, what chance do any of us have? I mean, I, I don't know how to, to, to draw a comparison here. Here's the best I can come up with. Do you remember, on, do you remember the show American Idol? Okay. And, and, on, and on the first episode every season, they would always find like some sweet, nice girl from, from some small town in some place like Kansas. And in her town, she's the best singer and everyone her whole life has told her how amazing she is. And then she gets to the audition and now for the first time in her life, she sees what real talent looks like and she hears what real talent looks like and she's just devastated and she's just crushed. Now multiply that by a trillion and we're starting to see what it's like for humans to stand in the presence of someone who is actually holy, who is actually good, who is actually glorious, who is actually powerful the one who holds the stars in his right hand, the one who was at the beginning, and the one who will be at the end. In the presence of someone so glorious and holy and powerful, our incompetence, our foolishness, our sin, the the, the stupidity of our pride and arrogance is suddenly brought to light as we realize how insignificant and tiny we are. When John sees his friend... In his glory, he falls down as if he's dead. This is what happens every time in the Bible somebody encounters God in his glory. Moses could not look at God in his full glory or he would die. When Isaiah went into the temple in his vision and the glory of God was there. I'm getting excited. The glory of God was there. Isaiah said, woe to me, I am ruined He was a prophet of God. He was better than you and me. And he says, I'm ruined in the presence of God. When John sees Jesus glorified, he's ruined. He's undone. Now, Now, this is a problem, friends. This is a problem. Because you and I were made to live in the presence of God. We see that already in Genesis chapter 2 in the Bible. We were made to experience God. We were made to live with God. We we were made. Every desire we have will not ultimately find its satisfaction until we see 
the face of God. Psalm 16 says that all joy is in the face and presence of God. But yet, not even John could stand in the presence of God. And neither can we. So what do we do with that? The answer is in the next verse. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I need to change my underwear. <laughs> Jesus touches him and says, do not be afraid. Why not? I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. The reason, John, why I don't want you to be afraid is because you were there on Easter. You were there at the cross. You saw me crucified. You saw me hanging there. You saw my lifeless body. And on Easter Sunday, you saw me alive and resurrected because I am the beginning and the end. I am the living one. And because I live, you also will live. And because I live, guess what that means? It means, and I hold the keys, let's go back, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Do you know what it means if you hold the keys? You're the owner, okay? Who owns the keys to Soldier Field? It used to be Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> Ownership was transferred to Jordan Love, okay? Ownership. You're in charge. Jesus said, I'm the owner. I'm the owner of death. I'm the owner of Hades. I'm the owner of the grave. It doesn't boss me around. I boss it around. And I'm the one who's living. And John, listen, I know you've suffered in my name. I know exactly what you've suffered in my name. But you do not need to be afraid because I am the living one. Now, imagine you start a new school somewhere around third grade, and you don't know any of the kids, and there is this kid on the playground, and man, he is the biggest kid, okay? He is the biggest kid. He is the tallest kid, and this kid walks up to you, and he looks at you, and he says, I'm going to be your best friend, and he is. From that day on, he is your best friend. Now, who are you going to be afraid of on the playground if the biggest kid on the playground is your best friend? Who are you going to be afraid of? Nobody. Biggest kid on the playground is your best friend. If the one who holds the keys of death and Hades is your friend, your best friend, what are you going to be afraid of? Are you really, come on, are you really going to be afraid of what Washington says about gun laws or about who's elected president or governor? Are you really going to be afraid if the economy has a hard landing instead of a soft landing if you have this picture of Jesus right here in your heart? He knows what John has suffered. John has suffered a lot in the name of Jesus, but he says, don't be afraid because I'm the one who is standing at the end. I am, and I rose on Easter Sunday, and I have the keys to death. And Hades. Are there going to be hard things in your life? Yes, Jesus promised there would be. He said, it is through many trials that we will enter the kingdom of heaven. He promised it. It's going to happen. We live in a broken world. We live in a fallen world. We live in a sin-filled world. That reality doesn't change until Jesus returns. But in this world, he says, do not be afraid. The biggest kid on the playground has said that to you. That's why the author of Psalm 147 said all of this the way he did. The Lord delights in those who fear him. Because once someone has gotten a 
glimpse, just the tiniest glimpse of who this God is that we are dealing with. Once someone gets the tiniest glimpse of who this Jesus is in his glory, the Jesus who was raised on Easter Sunday from death to life, who comes to us and says, don't be afraid because I am the living one. Once you see his glory and you say there's nothing to fear but God himself, fear of everything else just melts away. The Lord delights in those who fear him because we've seen who he is, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Jesus went to the grave and back for you because he loves you. And when you see that the most powerful person in the universe loves you with a dying and undying love, there's nothing to be afraid of once you fear him and put your hope in his unfailing love. So, To sum all of this up, what might John write to us in America about organizing our lives around Jesus? I think his summary might look a lot like what he wrote down for us in John chapter 6, where he wrote, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So there's going to be three truths that drive this entire series of First and Second Americans for us today. And they're all found in these verses. Here's the first one. Listen, Jesus is God's Son. He is the Word of God who was there at the beginning and who will be at the end and is with us right now. Jesus is God's Son. Second, Jesus is King. He wears many crowns. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is over all creation. He is King. Your feelings are not King. Your opinions are not King. Jesus is King. Third, Jesus has the words of eternal life. So we're not driven by every opinion and feeling and emotion out there. Jesus has the words that lead to everlasting life. As we go forward in this series in a few weeks, listen, we're going to talk about politics. And as we do, do you know what's going to guide us? Jesus is God's son. Jesus is king. And Jesus has the words of eternal life. And we're going to look at the contradiction between the American view of freedom and God's view of freedom. And as we do, what's going to drive us is that Jesus is God's son, Jesus is king, and Jesus has the words of eternal life. And in two weeks, on April 21st, in this series, I'm going to talk about our next steps forward as a church. You do not want to miss two weeks from today. But as we talk about what's next at Hope Church What's going to drive us is that Jesus is God's son, Jesus is king, and Jesus has the words of eternal life. I think that's what John would write to the church in America. Or, to say it even more simply, fear and love God. Because once you see who Jesus really is, once you fear and love God, you're not going to be afraid of anything ever again. Let's pray. Jesus, we are thankful that you came in humility, that you, the Word of God, became flesh and made your dwelling among us at Christmas, and that you bore our sins in your body on the cross that you humbled yourself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. But Jesus, may we never fail to see that you are also Alpha and Omega. You are beginning and end. You are King of Kings and you are Lord of Lords. And you were dead and now you are alive forever and ever. Jesus, help us to see you as you really are and how you will return to bring heaven down to earth and make everything broken right again so that we can be people who fear nothing on this earth, 
even when things are challenging or difficult, even when we get news that we don't want to get, you are Alpha and Omega. We put our hope in your unfailing love. May we be a people who fear nothing ever but you, because you are good. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.